In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. One of the common hallmarks of the hierarchs, which we now call the God-bearing fathers of our Holy Church, is that they were very sensitive about the dogmas of the Orthodox faith. They were very sensitive about these dogmas and teachings because they had divine vision. They were vessels of the Holy Spirit who spoke with God and with whom God spoke, like the prophet Moses. And because of this, they knew that heresy would contaminate the church and that like a disease, like a sickness, it would go throughout the whole body. And remembering the scriptural verse, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off, they would cut off the putrid members, those who in their haughtiness and in their pride did not have this vision of God and did not have the ability to speak with God and who did not have the blessing of hearing the voice of God who spoke to them. Particularly throughout the ages, we find that the monastics were defenders of the Orthodox faith. Those who actually learned and lived the life of humility and meekness when it came to the dogmas became staunch defenders. Oftentimes, even nowadays, there are people who are not like these fathers, who are not like those monastics, who are not like the God-bearing fathers, and who defend in the wrong spirit. And this also can become the root of another schism, simply because they did not have the same spirit, even as the Holy Apostle Paul says, concerning the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. And recently, we hear and have heard concerning those patriarchates which have fallen from the traditional teachings of the fathers, which should be a cause of great sadness to every Orthodox Christian. Some people are happy about it. Some people enjoy mocking them enjoy the fact that we're separated, we should actually be very sad over the fact that we are separated because at one time the glorious Church of Jesus Christ had all these patriarchates which were all defending the Orthodox faith with one mouth and one heart. And whenever they, the patriarchs and the hierarchs with them, would sense that the Church was in danger because of false doctrine, they became, as we said, the staunch defenders of orthodoxy, and now their names are listed in the list of saints of our church. All one has to do is go and read their lives, and we will find how much they defended the faith and how their defense of the faith, coupled with their divine vision, brought such great results that they became what we call the God-bearing fathers. We have many examples that we can enumerate. One, I remember from the life of St. Paisius the Great, when he was dealing with one of his disciples, he asked his disciple to go on an errand to do some work. And on the road, the disciple came across someone who was a Jew someone who did not believe in Jesus Christ. And the Jew recognized the monk as a Christian and as a matter of fact said to the monk that Jesus Christ was not the Messiah. And the monk, in order to go ahead and finish his own business, just answered indifferently, maybe, whatever. When he went back to his elder, St. Paisius the Great, 
Simpaisius, although he did not know the actual details of what happened, he did know that his disciple lost the grace of baptism. And he asked him, what happened to you? How is it that you lost the grace of baptism? And the monk couldn't think of what it was that caused him such a great, such a great um, tragedy that he would lose his very baptism, the grace of his very baptism. And he thought it over and he just, he remembered this one event. He says, well, I said, maybe. I said, whatever. And St. Paisis corrected his monk and the monk understood that this was not the way that a Christian should act. So fast forward many generations. Here, not too far from our monastery, New York City, the Patriarch of Constantinople, the leader of the so-called modernistic groups, decided that he was going to go to a synagogue where they all got together and they all honored each other one way or another and prayed, talked about the common God, the Father. One does not need to be extremely intelligent to make the connection. Another patriarch made a, a very famous statement, well known, concerning Muhammad as an apostle of God. One does not need to be very intelligent. One just needs to go and read the lives of the saints, particularly those who were martyred during the 500 year occupation under the Ottoman Empire. The voice of the new martyrs is quite different from that voice. Not too long ago, the Church of Hagia Sophia, the Church of the Holy Wisdom in Constantinople, was converted into a mosque. And one of the bishops of the Patriarchate of Constantinople, the Bishop of Myra, had an interview with a journalist in Greece. And the journalist asked him what he thought concerning the recent events. And he said that he was greatly grieved over the fact that he was converted from a museum to a mosque, but he specified he wasn't really grieved over the fact that it became a mosque, but over the fact that the leader of the Turkish people was stubborn and he stubbornly converted it into a mosque, but he himself would have no problem going into any mosque because he said, we all worship the same God. To say this publicly makes one wonder what is said behind clo closed doors in the synod meetings of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. If it were to be one bishop here or there, this is a common thing that we hear, that if it's one bishop, the whole church does not fall. But it's not one bishop, particularly when we're talking about the, the Patriarchate of Constantinople, unfortunately. And then we hear that the old calendars are all divided, which is actually a slander. It's not exactly true. The reason why it's not exactly true is because from 1925, and on, there were two groups. Those who were more extreme in their views and those who were not. And it's ironic that uh, many of the new calendars would say that those two groups should have been one group because I'm sure that they would never agree with the extreme views of the faction of what we call the Matthewites. And some had some sympathies towards our 
Synod under Metropolitan Chrysostomos of Florida. But there are many Vagante groups. In fact, there are many Vagante groups which are breakaway groups from the new calendars, and they're calling them old calendars. In other words, there are bishops who are either deposed or who decide to start their own synod from one, one way or another, and they classify them as old calendars. Some of them even use the new calendar. They use both new and old calendar. So it's the exact opposite. The new calendars are divided. These numbers are insignificant for them because they're small groups, but they're not classified with us. We have one schismatic group among the Florinites. We are the overwhelming majority. Our synod is, I would even say, the continuation of the Rokor in many ways, because our ordinations came from Rokor, from the bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church abroad. We have a common saint with these people, St. John Maximovich, who's the patron saint of our monastery. And this patron saint would come regularly, particularly when he was in New York, to my cathedral, to the cathedral of our metropolis, the cathedral of St. Markella. And he would stand on the throne and he would pray together with these so-called schismatics. There is one group that even in their own periodicals have admit that they sinned. And they said, although we sinned, God blessed our sin, which sounds pretty horrible. But besides that, I think that the modernists need to be very careful of pointing fingers because things are getting worse and worse for them. Between Jerusalem and Antioch, which have cut communion, between Russia and Constantinople, which have cut communion, it's a real mess. Things are turning back on them. And there are people looking towards us. There are people that are trying to find some type of ecclesiastical normalcy, people that could actually agree with their bishops. What a horrible thing it is for monastics who have learned concerning obedience to disagree so much even about dogmatic matters and ecclesiastical, ecclesiological matters with their own bishops, being disobedient to their bishops about certain things. For example, the bishops will forbid them to baptize the heretics, but they feel like they should baptize them, and that's what they should do. So on the one hand, they agree with us, but on the other hand, they're under these different bishops. Remember one of the top theologians, a famous theologian among them, at one time said that the patriarch of Constantinople is a heretic, but if you do not commemorate him, you are a schismatic, which is strange ecclesiology. So, as I said, we don't take delight in any of these things, but we must have the vision of God. We must pray to God for enlightenment to be able to understand why it is that our faith is so important to us. It's important to us because it's the revelation of God to us that is no small matter. Nowadays, it's common for people to say, well, I believe this and I believe that, there's no basis to their beliefs. They just feel like believing things. It's not like that with us. We believe in Jesus Christ because he revealed himself to us. He revealed himself to the world. 
And when God comes to the world, no one has a right to change the facts about him just because you feel like it. The mind of man has a hard time comprehending God. And when a person comes closer to God, he starts to understand how far away and how lost the mind of man is when he trusts in himself and thinks that he has some type of an insight when he's dealing with the awesome, fearful, dread God of all, as if there's a match. This revelation is twofold. First, he reveals himself to us through his Gospels in the Church. Second of all, as St. Paul says, he reveals himself to us in our hearts so that we actually have this revelation inside of us to believe those things which are spoken of in the Gospels. And one of the ways that we know that the faith is divine and not worldly is when you hear what you've heard me call strange teachings, like love your enemies, do good to those people who hate you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, give them the other cheek too. That's not normal for a fallen man. That is something above fallen human nature. That is something divine. Whereas in these other religions you'll find that people want to remain down on the earth and keep things worldly. But with our faith, the truth, we are brought up on high. We are lifted on high through this revelation, through this communion with Jesus Christ, the one true God. And we know him to be the one true God because he also speaks to us. Not in a deluded way, but he speaks to us always through the Gospels and the services. Now, the Lord always tries to speak to our hearts one way or another. And he wants his messages to be heard. So let us always sincerely pray, because another hallmark of these Holy Fathers was sincerity. They didn't waste their time talking about how horrible people were all the time. But after they received this illumination and purification, they were able to articulate true doctrine and tell people what they needed to be careful of. They were not impulsive people. It took a while for them sometimes. They would need to pray. They would fast. They would need to study. They would need to inquire. They would need to have counsel. And then things would become abundantly clear. And they would make things abundantly clear, rather, for the whole church. So let us then pray that God will always, always preserve us from all manner of heresy and all manner of schism that he will protect this sacred monastery and all of the parishes of our sacred metropolis and of all of our metropolises, of all the Orthodox, that he would preserve us in oneness of mind and in orthodoxy of faith, because another hallmark of the true hierarchs that have gone before us was their concern for the unity of the Church. This also was and is and will always be a dogma because God is one God and that is always stressed. The unity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is always stressed and the unity between the Christians is always stressed. So there may be a time <clears throat> when there will be larger groups who will understand these things and come together fighting the common fight, but God only knows. It would be good, welcome news. But for us, let us remember these things that we heard tonight 
And let us also keep in mind, as I said this morning, the prerequisite for sanctification is orthodoxy of faith. And finally, we end by giving thanks and glory to God for deeming us worthy to be members of His Holy Church. May He protect all of us from those voices, those evil voices of the enemy and his minions and his fallen angels who tried to whisper into the ears of the Christians, particularly those Christians who are trying to be true Christians, to pull them away from the one true church. Let us give thanks to our Savior that he's deemed us worthy to have this blessed apostolic succession, which came from hierarchs who were true confessors of the Orthodox faith, namely the hierarchs of the Russian Orthodox Church abroad, who considered our mother church in Greece a sister church under St. Philaret, the Metropolitan of New York, whose relics are incorrupt and who we all consider a saint because of his great boldness before the Master Jesus Christ. Although we are unworthy to follow in their footsteps, we count on their prayers, not just St. Philip, but so many others. There was also the Holy Vladika Andre, who was a man of God, another saint. There was a Vladika Yoasov of Canada, another man of God, another saint. There was the famous Vladika Verki, a pious, godly man, and so many others. May we have their prayers. And let us always, beloved brethren, remember to pray for these things. Let us pray that our Lord will preserve us from schism and heresy and deem us worthy to have a Christian and an Orthodox ending to our lives, painless, blameless, and peaceful, so that we, united with one another, may unite ourselves first to the one God and Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, to whom be glory, honor, and adoration unto the ages of ages. Amen.